let me start with a short story. When I was seven years old, the kids in my school were offered a choice of after-school classes. All the classes were for all the children, except for the woodwork class, which was for boys only. I couldn't understand why girls weren't allowed to do woodwork, although it did make me want to try it. Because neither my mother nor my teacher could explain, I found myself, age seven, in the principal's office on my very first feminist mission. <laughs> Back then, I didn't know nothing about sex or gender, but now I can say that I was already advocating for a world without gender. I used gender to refer to the social meaning of sex, the social meaning of being female or male. A world without gender is a world in which there are humans with male, female, or intersex genitalia, but there are no boys and girls, and no men and women. In such a world, sex is simply one of our physical characteristics, like height, weight, or the color of our eyes. Clearly, whether you are male or female is very important in some situations. For example, when you're planning to have a baby and want to achieve this by having sex with another person. Or even more commonly, when you're planning to have sex with another person but don't want to end up with a baby. <laughs> but the importance of sex in our society extends far beyond reproduction. Sex affects every aspect of our interactions with others, how we perceive them, how we react to them, and what we expect of them. And people may react strongly, even violently, towards individuals who breach these expectations. Think of the reactions to a boy who wants to play with dolls or wear a skirt, to an assertive female leader, or to a stay-at-home dad. The social meaning of sex beyond reproduction is what we call gender. Gender is a binary social system that is built on the assumption that humans belong to two types, not only in terms of their genitalia, but also with respect to the roles they should play in society and to their psychological characteristics. Men from Mars, women from Venus. Take, for example, the ordinary scenario of a nursery teacher who calls boys, Take the ball, go, play outside. Girls, come and listen to a story. This teacher is assuming that kids with male genitalia belong to one kind of children, those who love playing ball but not listening to stories, whereas kids with female genitalia belong to another kind of children, those who love stories but not playing ball. I see that some of you are thinking, but boys and girls, men and women are different. Knowing whether someone has male or female genitalia tells us a lot about this person. But does it really tell us a lot? Beyond the genitalia, do we really belong to two types? I have dedicated over a decade of my academic career to this question. I wanted to know whether beyond the genitalia, humans belong to two types whether the division of humans into female and male extends beyond the genitalia into our brain and mind. To find the answer, I launched a very large-scale study in which we analyzed the structure of over 20,000 human brains and the attitudes, preferences, and behaviors of over 10,000 people. Like other scientists before us, we found differences between women and men. But we went one step further and asked, do these differences add up consistently within each individual to create female and male brains and minds? We discovered that they do not add up this way. Instead, each brain and each individual is comprised of a unique mosaic, a mix of characteristics. Some 
that are more common in women and others that are more common in men. Let me show you the results of one such study. In this study, we divided each brain into 116 regions, measured the volume of each region in each brain, and wrote it down in a table. In this table, each line presents the brain of a single individual, the volume of the 116 regions. Next, to appreciate similarities and differences between the brains of men and women, we used color to paint each cell with a green-yellow color code. Green, if the volume of this region in this brain was relatively large compared to the volume of this region in all other brains, men and women combined. Yellow, if the volume of this region in this brain was relatively small. When we were done, this is what we saw. Brains of men on the left, brains of women on the right. Each line, a single brain. You don't need statistics to see that there are differences between women and men. At the group level, there's more green at the women's side and more yellow at the men's side. But brains are rarely all green or all yellow. Instead, each brain is a unique mosaic. No two lines are the same. Of green, which is more common in women, and yellow, which is more common in men. I always show these images when I talk about sex and the brain because they provide an alternative to the prevalent binary framework. In the binary framework, men and women are either the same or different. But when we look at these images, we see a third option. We are all different. No two brains are the same. In fact, in subsequent studies, we showed that sex provides no information about the similarities and differences between two brains. The fact that I have female genitalia doesn't mean that my brain is more similar to the brain of this lady than to the brain of that gentleman. So after a decade of extensive research, I can now safely say, the division of the genitalia into female and male does not extend into our brain. There are no male and female brains. There are human brains. They are wonderfully variable. And so too is our mind. Yes, at the group level, there are differences between women and men in some preferences, attitudes, and behaviors. But each of us is comprised of a unique mosaic of gendered characteristics. Some of our characteristics are feminine. That is more common in women than in men. Others are masculine. For example, I love practicing martial arts, but hate dealing with the kids' bikes or learning how to operate my new cell phone. I often cry at movies, but I really don't like shopping. I'm sure you could also name some feminine and some masculine characteristics of your own. As you already know, we've recently launched a website in which people can explore their own gender mosaic. First, they answer a set of questions about attitudes, preferences, and behaviors. For example, when choosing a romantic partner, how important is it to you that your partner is rich? Please, choose a number between zero, unimportant, to four, indispensable. Remember this answer? I'll come back to it shortly. After completing the questionnaire, participants receive feedback on how feminine or masculine they are on each trait compared to others around the world. Obviously, what's considered feminine and what's considered masculine may differ across cultures. So let me explain how we define these. This is a distribution of the answers of 1,500 people from Japan to the question you just answered. How important is it to you that your romantic partner is rich? Men's answers are shown in blue, women's answers in red. We can see that more women than men chose answers two, three, and four. So choosing one of these answers would be considered feminine. If your answer was two, three, or four, the corresponding square in your mosaic would be red or pink. 
In contrast, answer zero was more common among men than women. So choosing this answer would be considered masculine and colored in blue. Finally, answer one. It was similarly common among men and women. So it is neither feminine nor masculine. It is gender neutral. If you chose answer one, the corresponding square in your mosaic would be yellow. Simple. But what will happen if instead of comparing your answer to those of the Japanese sample, we compared it to the answers of 1,500 Americans? <laughs> we can see that in this sample, there was hardly any difference between women and men in their answers to this question, making all answers gender neutral. So regardless of how much you or how much important it is to you that your romantic partner is rich, the corresponding square in your mosaic would now be yellow. This is my mosaic, when my answers were compared to those of the American sample. On some traits, I'm feminine or slightly feminine. On others, more, I'm masculine or slightly masculine. And on some, I'm gender neutral. See how my mosaic changes when my answers are now compared to the Japanese sample and then to a sample from Israel. Remember, I have not changed and my answers have not changed. What has changed is their definition as feminine, masculine or gender neutral in each country. Isn't this absurd? I'm the same person with my unique set of attitudes, abilities, and preferences. Yet whether these are considered appropriate to people with my type of genitalia varies across cultures. Clearly, different cultures value differently some attitudes and preferences. But why should such judgments depend on whether we have female or male genitalia? I'm not unique in being mosaic. Many people around the world have already completed the questionnaire and shared with me their mosaics. Isn't this amazing? See how wonderfully different we are all are? And to think that we live in a culture that attempts to put us all into two boxes, girls and boys, men and women. Doesn't this make you two wish we were living in a world without gender, in which each of us could live according to their unique mosaic of attitudes and abilities, rather than according to the type of genitalia we have? If this future is difficult to imagine, think of the fact that some of us are left-handed and some are right-handed. Not so long ago, left-handed people were considered as less capable, both mentally and physically, compared to right-handed people. Neuroscientists were looking for deficits in the brains of left-handers that could account for their presumed inferiority. Teachers and parents, when they noticed that the kid was using the left hand, used to tie that hand, so the kid had to use the right hand. But nowadays, whether you are left-handed or right-handed carries no meaning beyond the description of a physical characteristic. Like sex. Handedness is important in some situations. For example, when you're getting ready for your next tennis match. But we don't care even one bit if the bus driver or the US president are right-handed or left-handed. You wouldn't tell your friends that the lecture you heard today was given by a right-handed person. So why tell them it was given by a person with female genitalia. The endless labeling of people by the type of genitalia they have conveys the message that humans with male or female genitalia belong to two types in every aspect of human existence. Why open a music concert with ladies and gentlemen? How is our genitalia relevant in a music concert? Wouldn't it sound awful if the concert opened instead with left-handers and right-handers, or with blacks and whites? Whenever you hear 
boys and girls, women and men, ladies and gentlemen, and it sounds okay to you, try replacing it with blacks and whites. All the black kids, come, listen to a story. White kids, take the ball, go, play outside. If it's not okay with blacks and whites, it is also not okay with girls and boys, men and women. People often ask me whether in a world without gender, there would still be group level differences between humans with male and female genitalia. I tell them that I have no clue there may be such differences and there may not be. But I am certain that in a world without gender, we simply wouldn't care. And why should we? If I love martial arts, why should I or anyone else care whether practicing martial arts is more common among humans with male or female genitalia? We don't care whether it's more common among humans with blue or brown eyes. And the reason we don't care is not because there are many studies showing that there are no differences between humans with blue and brown eyes. We don't care because eye color carries no social meaning. Gender is not a reflection of sex. Gender is one of the prisons within which we live. Gender is a social system that divides the world into things for males and things for females. And if we want things that are not on our side, we are punished by society. Imagine a world without gender in which we are all free to choose from all the wonderful things this world has to offer. Thank you.